Gustafsson. As you pass these puppets around the audience, I'm, uh, I'm not going to let you do that. It's, okay, uh, it's far too valuable. I watched it now. <laughs> but it's important to see them and uh, for you to understand that um, one of the choices we made with these puppets is to not do uh, substitution animation for the majority, which is normally, or one of the techniques in favor is to print all the faces with all the vowels, consonants, and expressions and give them like a catalog to animators. And we chose mechanical puppets so that the connection with the animator is very profound and intimate. And Pinocchio is an exception, the cricket and the lower mouth of Spazzatura. But it's good to have them because then you can do a little demonstration. And then you take one photo. You take another one. You do that 24 times, you get one second. And the movie is two hours. Wow. And then Guillermo says, reshoot that. <laughs> we should do take two. We did, we did. We actually did a few shots uh, twice. Well, Mark, you know, uh, Guillermo Toro comes to you and says, I want to do Pinocchio. What excites you about the movie that he pitches to you? What, what, what makes you want to go on this journey? I, I just think it was the unique take that um, he and Patrick, uh, his co-writer, had on the story. Um, uh, they, they came at it with the notion of what is important about being disobedient <coughs> as opposed to obedience. I mean, they, in the standard story, uh, Pinocchio has to be a good boy and learn these lessons and then he becomes a real boy. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, how do you learn to be yourself? How do you learn to be real? You learn by questioning. And, uh, and that seemed like a really interesting idea to me and a reason to tell this story again in a completely different way. Yeah. Give me a sense of, of, of both your history with stop motion. Because I mean, my understanding is it kind of started around the same time, be in different places. Very different places. But when you start? Uh, I did a thesis film. I had never done any animation in, for my thesis in, in art school. I did a film called uh, Three Constipated Gargoyles Reaching Critical Mass at Ground Zero. Oh, so, wow. It was really sophisticated, and I think that's why I kind of wanted to work with me. It was, uh, no, I just borrowed a camera. Uh, I was at Will Vinton Studios, or, or had done a, a little apprenticeship there, and and uh, I borrowed a camera from somebody and got some clay, and it was it just seemed really exciting to be able to, you know, bring something to life. I didn't know at all what I was doing, uh, so it was a real commitment. But yeah, the rest I just just kept doing it. And Guillermo, you you I mean, this is your first feature animating uh, animated film as a director officially, but I mean. Yeah. You know, you I have co-directed a couple of pilots and a yeah. couple of episodes yeah. of the series I created on DreamWorks, uh, Tales of Arcadia, which was three series in a feature. And, um, and take I, us all the way, all yeah, the way back. Like and, and, well, when I started, I started with uh, um, animation before live action in a way. I was teaching animation in high school at 17 to kids 15 and 14. I started a company that did for 10 years special effects and stop motion. And I was supposed to start with a stop motion movie before Kronos. I, uh, between uh, my then girlfriend and my brother and I, we built over a hundred puppets. With clay, we, I did the armatures, we did the sculpting, the design, we built a few sets. And we started the first day of photography. I was animating the puppet. We left for dinner and we got burglarized. And, and the burglars, frustrated for not finding anything of value, crushed every single puppet and pooped and peed all over the floor, which was the signal to go to live action. <laughs> <laughs> I said, a live action it is. And then uh, after, after Pan's Labyrinth or around Pan's Labyrinth, we started talking about Pinocchio around 2004. 
and we were already being happily rejected in 2008 by every major studio. Everybody passed, but it took about 15, 16 years to make the movie, to get it done. And uh, I started, I said, if I'm going to do Pinocchio, I need to reacquaint myself with every tool possible. Now I went to DreamWorks and I uh, produced or executive produced or consulted on Kung Fu Panda 2, 3, Puss and Boots, Mega Mind, Rise of the Guardians, etc., etc., and the series we created, and then came full circle. And I, I wanted to work with Mark very, very much because uh, he is a hero of mine. Yeah. I absolutely am a fan of this man. Yeah. And not only as an animator, his instincts as director are beautiful, and we are compatible, and we are both, you know, strangely agreeable to each other. <laughs> I don't know why, but we do get along very well, oh. and and uh, I, I, we got together the magnificent seven of animation everywhere. We got the best cinematographer with pra Frank Passingham, the best puppet maker with Georgina, the best animators from all over the world, and and I'll conclude with this: the equipment that I use for my company stayed alive in Mexico and kept stop motion alive in my city, Guadalajara. Everyone including Oscar-nominated movies, shorts, use the equipment we had. And what we did, as soon as we got to Pinocchio Green Ladies, we created a workshop in Guadalajara, and we gave a section of the movie to be animated in my hometown. Yeah. Was the plan always for this to be a musical adventure? It was, was music and song very, very much central for you from the beginning? The, the story was always the same, but according to the screenplay, we, we did two full screenplay teams. The, the variances on that story were there, but we always thought about it as a musical on the beginning. Uh, you know, we talked to Nick Cave, and Nick Cave came in, and uh, I was very impressed. I was, oh my God, this rock star. And, I, and then, it, it was pretty difficult to to make an appointment with Nick Cage sure. for further work. And then we went uh, to Beck, and I met with Beck, and I was, oh my God, a rock star. And I, again, it was hard to get back. So Alexander and I talked, and I said, you know who's available? <laughs> Me. <laughs> so we did the lyrics of the lullaby, yeah. and, uh, and Alexander said, oh, this is great. We Seamless, you should write everything. And about two months later, he said, you shouldn't write everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he called Cats, and let's take it from there. But it was always, the idea is, we were going to have songs, and uh, we were going to go counter to a musical, and when the big song is coming with the cricket, the one that explains everything, he gets crushed every time. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, the second half, everybody stops singing, and fascist music takes over, mm. hymns and marches and songs. Well, Alexander, uh, you know, aside from your supreme availability, um, <laughs> you also had this... Uh, I have to go. <laughs> you also had this fabulous journey with Guillermo, with Shape of Water, and uh, just uh, the most incredible score, and the most incredible collaboration. What was special about that, that experience for you that you, uh, and, um, um, you know, that you wanted to repeat, I suppose, with Pinocchio, and what was exciting about this new uh, experience? You know, the, the fact that there are songs in this, the fact that music is so integral to it, it seemed like very distinct experiences. They're distinct, but it, it, in fact, they're, they're, to me, they're both live-action movies. It's strange, I, I feel the same emotion when I watch uh, Pinocchio, when I watch The Shape of Water, and Guillermo's world is some people say it's dark, it's not dark, it's just deep, there's just depth, there's uh, soul, and, uh, and Pinocchio, the, the film, is, is just full of soul and emotion. Um, so that, for a composer, there's so many options to, to explore, because it's not just a one-dimensional type of character or a one-dimensional story. There's so many layers and so many depth of field that you can visit, um, and that's and this added to, to the way Guillermo structures his, uh, his dramaturgy, the way his camera moves, it's flawless. And that's another thing that music is, you know, music is horizontal, it goes from A to Z. And uh, you just 
put your hand on the film and it takes you down the river very easily. You just have to work, but it's it's not it's not um, it's not painful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And and Guillermo has a passion for music, for music in general, for music in his films, for music in cinema. Uh, it's the best world I can imagine. Dance in Colombia. <laughs> no, no, but uh, Alexander has a thing that I think the highest form of art is that which evokes a beauty that is so powerful and otherworldly that you feel the transcendence and the loss of something that never was at the same time. So it can only exist in art. And that's the type of beauty we wanted to do with the images, with the emotions and with the music. And I don't think there is any other composer that does that. Not, not now. Well, and Alexandra, you know, you set yourself a very particular challenge here because you, you, you know, you're telling the story of a wooden boy and you made a very particular call. Tell me about that call and, and how it affected the process. The wood. The, 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 oh, yeah, the wood, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, Pinocchio is made of wood. <laughs> and that was, I know, it's, it's shocking. But uh, it's the first, it's the first, um, you know, obvious thing. He's made of wood and... So maybe, and Geppetto is a, is a woodworker, so maybe there was something there to explore. Uh, in Shape of Water, we explored the, the watery sounds, the whistle, um, and uh, 12 flutes, you know, to create a sound that belonged to the Shape of Water. And in this one, I just challenged uh, Guillermo and myself in trying to use only wood instruments. So it's woodwinds, uh, uh, strings, of course, piano, harp, guitars, mandolin, uh, Maria. Uh, Marimba, yeah, and, and it creates, uh, I'm sure it's, it's not conscient, I hope it's not conscient for the audience to, 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 to pay attention to it, but it creates a sound that I think stays with you in a different way than if it were just a traditional orchestra. Well, no, we, we don't, we're not showing a clip today, but I do want to ask about the animation style uh, on, the, on the film. Uh, you know, it feels incredibly unique, it feels incredibly uh, individual. How important was it for you? Let's give us a little sense of the philosophy behind that, Mark Guillermo, uh, and, and, and why it was important to do it in the way that you've done it. Well, we really wanted to give agency over the, uh, the performances the, back to the animators as much as possible. Uh, we wanted them to uh, take pride in these shots and own the shots. Uh, I was an animator for many years, and I know that feeling. There's, there's nothing quite like it. And God, you should have animated on the phone. <laughs> but we. It's, <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, we um, <laughs> so we went out and we got everybody that I really had always wanted to work with and people that I'd worked with in the past, the best of the best animators. And. Uh, and you know the kind of instructions we would give them. We would say, we want, we have to hit this mark, we need, this is what the character is thinking about, and we want to see in the animation, we want to see the character thinking. We don't, we don't want it to move, we want it to be alive, and there's a big difference. And, and then we also said, look, if you, during the course of this, because it's just you, and this is something that's unique to stop motion, I think, it comes down to an animator with the puppet in a very intimate relationship. And so you are performing this thing. And if you discover something along the way that you think can make this better, then go ahead. Mm. Uh, and we wanted them to feel free to do that. And of course, you know, you, you're going to fail occasionally. And we said, that's okay. You know, because it's worth the investment for us to, to get to another place with these performances. Mm. I think we. I think uh, we believe a few things in this film. How many of you have seen it? God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else gets no bumper. Uh, we want. We believe several things. We believe that animation is not a goddamn genre for kids. It's a medium that is perfect for art and spirituality. that we should be bold, we should be crazy, we should try things that have never been done, push the art. Yes. We also believe that animators are actors, 
their cast and should be credited right up front next to the cast. And we did that. Yeah. And we believe that between action and cut, they are in command. Now, for those of you that don't know how it's done, you have an exposure sheet and you're going to map, obviously, the lip sync and every move that you're going to do. Uh, and then you, are, you have almost a regimented 24 frames a second critical route, but our animators were so good that they found things also. And we dictated certain things, which I, if, if and when you see the movie again or for the first time, you will notice. I have a personal crusade and a very, I, I, I abhor pantomime. I abhor that every goddamn animated movie has the same poses. If I see another character do that, or raise an eyebrow and cross the hands, or have this sort of hip and happening valley uh, emoji, emoticon, goddamn language that simulates humanity, I will puke. So, we said, number one, uh, let's give them micro gestures and, and almost neuro-linguistic programming, inputting like move, move the eyes around, look away. Is, is the character in pain? Give me moments where they rub their knuckles or their knees if it hurts. When they're tired, they should sit tired. When they're active and younger, they can move like that. Pinocchio starts the, the, the film like an unarticulated toddler almost and little by little learns to control the body and evolves. But, very important, and this is something beautiful, uh, we created failed acts at 24 frames a second, meaning uh, in animation there are two things I don't like. It's too animated, meaning everybody moves like in a sitcom. Everybody's frantic and demonstrating what they feel, and we said, let's do quiet moments in which we trust the actors and the audience leans in and then there's a swallow, a breath, a pause and they're looking at that character but the second is let's make mistakes quote unquote. Pinocchio goes to grab a pencil and there's one pencil, uh, there's no knob, another one and the third one. So we did 50 frames we didn't need but that tells you if there's life. There's a beautiful moment in which uh, Geppetto goes into an empty amphitheater and tangles with a floating balloon. And if it was a live actor, it would be improv. But it can because we have to rig the balloon with a little crane, rig Geppetto with a crane so he can fight it and put it on the expo exposure sheet. So we're doing an accident at 24 frames a second and shooting uh, quiet moments and giving the actors uh, moments to talk quietly the way we talk in real life, animation tends to make everything too efficient. And we didn't want that. If a cop is facing the wrong way, you turn the cop and then you grab it. And that gives you life. So we were pursuing life and truth. Because I think we are in a moment in which any medium you use to tell a story, the only thing you need to guarantee is that there's truth in it. Yeah. Because it's the scarcest value in art today. Yeah. Truth and emotion, because emotion, emotion is the antidote to irony, and irony is a defense, and emotion exposes you to danger, but is the only thing worth pursuing. Wow. the rest of the day. This belongs to me now, though. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, Guillermo Torres Pinocchio is in theatres now. And oh, God damn it, go! <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what the hell happened here? <laughs> Raise your hands. Next time I see you, you'll go. Yes. And we'll talk. Yes. Thank you, guys. Please share me.